Deutschman. I'm the Senior Communications Director at the Conservation Lands Foundation, and we're very excited to have you uh, join with us today for a conversation about climate change and public lands. Um, I'm going to do, I'm joined by some of our um, terrific colleagues, and we'll do a round of introductions, but um, just as we start here, a reminder that this, all of, as all of our webinars, um, will be recorded, and we'll send out uh, um, this recording and the slide deck that we're using, um, both to those that could make it and those that RSVP'd but could not um, make it. Um, and then we invite um, all of you to, you know, as you join in and want to share, if you see a chat, you can share kind of your name and where you're calling in from or where you're joining in from. We'd love to see um, the names and can't see all the faces, um, but we'd love to, to hear who's on um, and where you're calling in from. Um, and then uh, also share in the Q&A, any questions that pop up. And um, uh, we've got um, Paige Ladizinski. Um, who is with us from CLF will be monitoring that. Um, so to begin with, uh, as I mentioned, Chris Deutschman, the Senior Communications Director, I'm joining in from Sacramento, um, the indigenous lands of the, of the Nisenan um, people. And I will ask that uh, Tanae and the rest of our team introduce themselves. Hi, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mike, Nunenia Tanae Winder, Nunenia Tumutwachich Mamach. I just introduced myself in the Ute language. That's part of my background. I'm the Associate Communications Director, and I'm joining from Albuquerque, New Mexico, indigenous land of the Pueblo people. And there's actually 19 Pueblos in the state of New Mexico. So excited to get to work with you all today. And I will pass it off next to Jocelyn to introduce yourself. Hi, all. Jocelyn Torres. Um, she, use she, her pronouns in the Southern Paiute lands, which is uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, and I am our senior field director and excited to talk about 30 by 30 today and my home state of Nevada. I'll hand it off to Elian. Hi, hey everyone. I'm Elian Stefanik. I'm CLF's California program director, and I'm based in Half Moon Bay, California, which are the indigenous lands of the Ohlone Romaitash people. And I will hand it over to David. Hi, everybody. David Feynman, government affairs director based in Washington, D.C., the traditional homeland of the Piscataway and the Pamunkey peoples. Uh, and I'll be supporting uh, Chris and Tanea in their conversation piece about 30 by 30 and appropriations. Uh, and Paige. Hello, everyone. My name is Paige Ladezinski. I'm the Associate Development Director of Strategic Partnerships here at the Conservation Lands Foundation, joining from the Bay Area as well, Ancestral Homelands of the Ohlone people. Nice to see you all. Great. All right. Thank you, team. And we'll just dive in here. Um, so I'll walk through the elements of our conversation. Um, we have a, a deck here that Tanea will be hosting for us. Thank you, Tanea. Um, and we've got some elements here. You see, we've got a nice complement of our team and it goes to show, as I'm sure a lot of you experience, that um, the communications raising the visibility of our work really touches almost all aspects of an organization from field to policy to development. Um, and so this is a, a, you know, a healthy representation of that. So what we want, what we have planned um, to talk with you today is to provide an update on the national um, 30 by 30 campaign uh, to provide, um, we've started to build out a toolkit for use by our Friends Grassroots Network members and partners. Um, we've got a really strong start, we think, to the toolkit, but we'll certainly be adding to it. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. We certainly can't claim that we're gonna be the most or the most comprehensive, but we're certainly gonna do our best to make it the most relevant for the Friends groups as we see and, um, and identify different resources that we think could really help the work that you're doing on the ground. Um, and then um, we've got some examples of how our field teams are working um, with Friends Grassroots Network members 
to um, develop, to push state-based and local-based strategies to help achieve both climate change and the 30 by 30 goals to provide some examples. And then we'd like to sh have a few minutes of conversation about you know, um, what um, y'all are seeing in the field, what things you think would be helpful to, for us to be thinking about or putting into the toolkit. Um, we want this to be the start of an ongoing conversation and collaboration, kind of a new channel of work as it relates to climate change and public lands. And then, as David mentioned, we want to touch on a campaign that we are working on now um, that will be um, available to you shortly um, by next week at the latest um, related to uh, um, an in, a campaign to increase the funding for national conservation lands in the congressional um, budget and uh, next year's budget. And then obviously, you know, open up to some conversation around just general questions and, and thoughts and hopefully you can share some experiences and ideas um, that you have. So next slide, please, Tanea. Um, so diving in, you know, this is not a webinar on the science or the, um, you know, a deep dive into 30 by 30. Um, what we wanted to touch on here is just kind of ground people in the basics. There's a lot of information out there and certainly in the toolkit that we've provided resources, um, both that CLF has prepared, our policy team has prepared and walked through some of you um, with in terms of the science and, and how climate change and public lands um, are completely intertwined. Um, but to level set us here, um, you know, the 30 by 30 is the shorthand for protecting um, at least 30% of the nation's remaining land and waters by 2030 to maintain biodiversity and reduce the most severe impacts of climate change. And there's a lot of things embedded in that. Um, this is a global goal as well as a national and then a growing state goal um, where the U.S. has joined more than 50 countries um, in protecting 30% of land of their land and water. Um, and as Jocelyn and Elian will um, illustrate, states and local governments are making similar commitments, which then drops down to really help put, um, you know, bring to life the work that each of you are, you, are doing in your communities. Um, so the next thank you, uh, Tanea. Um, so as you know, you know, the work that you've been doing um, is and was important well before climate change has become kind of a main um, theme or one critical existential theme of our time. It's certainly a crisis um, and there's really a confluence of, you know, could be characterized as three crises. There's the climate change, there's the loss of biodiversity and all the ramifications that that means, and there's the public health crisis, um, you know, the COVID pandemic and beyond, you know, there's, um, um, systemic racism and issues of equity and access embedded in all three of those things. Um, but we're focused, so we wanted to put it in context that 30 by 30 is not the only framework, right, to talk about the values of the protections that you are seeking um, for your particular landscapes. But our focus here is to take a moment to really drop down and drill down into the frame of 30 by 30 and climate change in public lands so that um, it can you, you can take advantage of, if you will, the broader conversations that are happening um, on a policy standpoint that are happening in the news media, that are happening culturally, right? Our public awareness, people are just getting more and more um, attuned to the need. And we want to give you the tools to be able to um, uh, integrate you know, where your audience is as it relates to climate change and the work that you're doing so that you can provide them meaningful action to help you achieve your goals. So it's an urgent, climate change is an urgent rationale for protecting the landscapes that um, you care about currently. As you may have seen the stat, only 12% of the land is currently protected and could fall under that 30 by 30 um, definition. And as we all are familiar, um, you know, uh, the Bureau of Land Management is the largest public land manager, managing nearly three times the land of the National Park Service. So that takes us directly to, right, when you think about where solutions, you know, lie, the greatest potential is going to be with the Bureau of Land Management and therefore the work of our friends grassroots network, each of you. So it's a very, um, um, anxious time as it relates to these threats that are occurring. It's real. 
and it can be anxiety inducing, but at the same time, you know, we at CLF can feel uplifted and I can speak for myself, you know, I get, um, I can get motivated knowing um, that the work of all the friends are doing, the work that CLF is doing to be part of the solution. So it's an unnerving time, but also an exciting time because we can be part of the solution. Next slide. And so there's two things that, um, that we feel at least at this point provide um, some real, uh, some valuable resources and information for you that Tanea is gonna walk through. So there is a national, there's a global campaign, but uh, uh, dropping down from that, there's the American Nature Campaign um, that's being, um, uh, that was initiated by the National Geographic Society, the Weiss Foundation and other partners um, who are really, you know, focused in on getting any, all and every entity, elected official, um, you know, uh, influencers, you know, to really drive home the goal and achieve the goal of 30 by 30. Um, CLF, many of you may be part of the day-to-day, -day, week week-to-week work of the American Nature Campaign. Um, many of you have seen perhaps content that we'll, we'll provide or pass along to the friends groups anywhere from, so this is the organizations that are working to get sign-on letters from all the mayors, you know, that are working to get studies out and providing the fuel um, in, in many different forms um, for making the case and helping to raise the visibility in the media, among policymakers, among supporters, among your funders. Um, so a lot of the work that you'll see in our toolkit um, comes from here and then also from the individual partners, including CLF, that um, provide uh, content for the Nature Campaign. Um, and so we've taken that and kind of curated uh, is the start of a curated toolkit um, specifically for the Friends um, Grassroots Network. And so with that, I'll pass it on to Tanea to walk you through what we've started. Thank you, Chris. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of what's in our toolkit. Um, I'm not going to click on these right now because when I click, it will take us out of it into the actual toolkit. But just so you can get um, a highlight and overview of what's inside the toolkit, it's kind of just us trying to gather all of the resources about 30 by 30 and put it into just this, this one toolkit that has all the information you need for folks who just want to get that high level view of it to folks who want to take the deeper, deeper dive. There's so much in this. There's other toolkits that people have put together that are embedded within this as well. But the highlights of the toolkit include the presidential executive order, like it links to the hyper, it hyperlinks to the text of that. Um, National Conservation Lands and Climate Resilience Overview. This is a presentation that happened last year from some staff members as well that dives into why we need 30 by 30 from the climate perspective and just the science behind that. Some state one pagers, which I will show you um, what, what states we have right now next. And then national campaign assets, state map of 30 by 30 policies, using Patagonia Action Works to amplify some of the things that you're doing whether it's programming or petitions or getting support, we have how to's on how to use that. And just background resources for those of you who just really wanna get that in-depth perspective um, to help you when you're coming up with your programming or when you're um, coming up with your communications for those different things. And again, the webinar is being recorded like all of our webinars. And afterward, when I send the follow-up and the recording, I can send the toolkit so you can just get a look at, at that as well. But included in the toolkit was the one state, the state one pagers. So these are the ones we have completed so far, Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, and just a general overview of CLF. So these are just some snippets so you can see what's included in, the, in these state one pagers. It has the state, it has some highlight areas of the areas we work with. It lists the friends groups in that state, also just you know, how much um, conservation lands affect the, each state's economy. Just a quick reference sheet that you can take when you're meeting people and wanting to speak about the work you do and the places that you protect. So that's a little bit about the toolkit. Again, just a brief overview, and you will be getting this toolkit sent to you via email in the follow-up as well. But next, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Jocelyn. Thank you. Yeah, so um, 
figured for this section, we would just dive in a little deeper of, of how this campaign is rolling out um, in states and sharing Nevada as an example. Chris mentioned at the beginning, right, that um, the Bureau of Land Management is gonna have an outsized role in helping meet this goal. And I think, you know, all of us who live in Nevada know that the state will, you know, play an outsized role because of that. Um, the state, you know, is almost 90% um, federal land. And, and a lot of that is, you know, multiple use under BLM. And so there's plenty of opportunity to um, protect, right, and help the nation meet this goal. Um, you know, as part of that, I think uh, we sort of knew the administration's executive order was is moving forward, but we had, you know, an opportunity with our state legislature that only meets once every other year. <laughs> so if we didn't take this, then we would have to wait, you know, two years to really push um, the legislature on uh, helping us achieve this goal. And, and so folks moved pretty quickly to get um, assembly joint resolution three drafted um, in before the legislature. I, I will say, you know, the um, joint resolution has passed the committee and it has passed the assembly and it's on its way um, next week to the state Senate, um, you know, where they'll have a hearing and, um, you know, fingers crossed, move that forward and get this uh, passed. I, I wanted to highlight this resolution specifically because I think a lot of us are tackling with um, what do we do in state, right? What is our role? Um, and we get a lot of questions of like, well, what does this mean for our state? Um, and we wanted to specifically with our work highlight, you know, the places that we're already working on. Um, so we're working on a campaign um, to create a national monument um, called Abiquame, which is in the Southern sort of portion of the state. Um, and a lot of folks are also working on you know, protections for the Desert National Wildlife Refuge in the form of um, wilderness. And, and so we felt like, you know, sometimes the big goals are broad, <laughs> but bringing it home to people in the places that they love and treasure, that it would easy, be easier to wrap your head around what this means, what it could mean for your community, right, and what the benefits would be to, to bringing these places um, into the, the fold of this 30% um, goal. Um, so, in this resolution, and I'm happy to send a link after as an example, you know, there are specific whereases about both of these places, the value of these places and how that connects to the larger values of 30 by 30. Um, we also, you know, felt that it was important to include some language about the process, um, ensuring, right, that indigenous communities are included, right, within these conversations, um, ensuring that people of, you know, all races, cultures, incomes, right, that, that this is a broad and inclusive coalition that's going to be recommending the places, right, that, that we believe should be um, protected as a part of, of 30 by 30, right, and we, we know there's a science, and I feel like folks have access to that, and we also felt like it went beyond in ensuring that, you know, communities were at the table, um, and that there were other, you know, values that we were keeping in mind, you know, cultural sites, um, sacred sites that were also um, included into the mix of these um, protections. And so that, that is moving forward um, and that has caught the interest of other decision makers. And so now we have our local county commission um, in Southern Nevada is putting forward, um, they've introduced a resolution um, last week, and they'll actually be having a hearing on it next Tuesday, um, again, highlighting these values and the need for an equitable and inclusive process. And also, I think, a, and an opportunity for all of us who work in, you know, with our special places that have been protected, highlighting, you know, the benefit of the existing protected places and the effort that we've already made to get us closer, right, to these goals. Um, and lastly, I would say, you know, there's a lot of interest and a lot of folks working on a 30 by 30 in our state. Um, and so we've um, been participating in a working group with other conservation organizations, uh, both nationally and locally, right, who work in Nevada to um, strategize and make sure we're all aligned on getting, you know, speakers out to these hearings, um, ensuring that our messaging is, is online, right, and that we take days of actions together. Um, for folks who were around in the Monuments campaign days, 
right? It made a big splash when all groups, you know, launched their social media on the same day. Um, and it could be easier to get something to trend or to grab a reporter's attention. So we're making an effort there and really coordinating with all local organizations. Um, and, and beyond the resolutions, I think sort of answering some big questions of like, who will be doing the inventorying for uh, the state, right? Like what is the list of places that are gonna get us to um, 30%? Uh, what are you know the wildlife corridors that we need to really focus on in all of those pieces? So um, lots of coordination there and, and we'll be around to answer any questions folks may have. Um, and we'll hand it over to Elion to talk about um, the work happening in California. Hey, thank you, Jocelyn. Um, so here in California, there, there was an effort, um, a year, year and a half effort to push a resolution for um, 30 by 30 in California's legislature and um, that did not pass. However, in, in the fall of last year, California Governor Gavin Newsom issued an executive order, um, essentially making um, 30 by 30 a priority for the state of California. And the goal there is that 30% of California's lands will be set aside for conservation and nature-based uh, solutions by the year 2030. Um, and much of the priorities within the executive order actually aligned well with the Biden administration's order. Um, the state is now on a sort of fast track approach to come up with two draft uh, multi-year strategies um, to implement the executive order. The first is a um, pathway to 30 by 30 strategy, and the second one is a natural and working lands climate strategy. Um, but their initial approach is, um, is that they want to hear from the public, they want to hear from communities about how to make this uh, successful. And so they've launched uh, um, the announcement actually of um, hosting nine regional workshops across the state. The first starts um, next week. And um, unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of information yet on the format or how they will be gathering um, public input. But um, the idea is there is that they wanna hear from local communities about how, how the, the state can meet this goal. Um, so in lieu of not having a whole lot of information from the state, um, many conservation organizations are quickly trying to organize in advance of these, of these workshops. So if, if folks are interested in um, being a part of those conversations, please reach out. I do also plan to send some updates to all of the friends groups here in California with more information on how to register for those workshops. And um, again, I have information on um, any of those planning calls that are that are taking place. But um, right now, some of the early ideas that we've come up with so far are to put together sign on letters um, for each of the regions that will highlight um, important values and also specific places that we would love for the state to um, protecting within their own jurisdiction or support protecting. And that for CLF, of course, will include uh, many of our, all of our priority landscapes. So areas in the California desert um, and other places in California and the Eastern Sierras. Um, one thing that is that is emphasized heavily in California's executive order is the need to identify um, equitable access to recreation and equitable access to these conservation areas um, as it relates to um, recreation specifically, but also ensuring that all communities can benefit from the clean air, clean water of of these um, protected areas. And so that's another avenue that um, CLF and other partners are looking to emphasize in these sign-on letters and in raising um, comments with, with the state and the California uh, Natural Resources Agency. Um, I do also wanna share one tool, I think that we can send in, uh, provide a link to in the follow-up email, but um, one of our partners, Defenders of Wildlife, created this fabulous tool called the California 30 by 30 Viewer. And if you look at it, it's, it's an interactive GIS map, um, which looks at different land, different types of land ownership in California. Um, so that's a great tool that will be helpful for the state and for um, these upcoming workshops. So with that, I will hand it back to Tanaya. All right, thank you, Elian. 
So for this next part, I know it's it's a different kind of conversation with the webinar format, but just based on what you've heard in this session today or just what you've heard outside learning about 30 by 30 and thinking about how you can apply it to your own work, we wanted to open it up to you all to see if you have um, questions or ideas on how CLF can support you all, what resources and tools would be helpful for you. So if you have been taking in this information and already you have ideas about, okay, I've heard all this, but I need help doing X, Y, and Z, um, feel free to use the chat option. You can also use the Q&A option as well. Um, and then we can open it up for some dialogue and I'll let any of my colleagues jump in as well if, if something has sparked that you want to share as well. Yeah, actually, Tanea, there's a couple things I, I um, that I'm wondering if um, Jocelyn and Elian can um, provide a little more detail or information on. So one is, I think I heard that in the resolutions, there's language in the resolutions that go beyond climate change, that even though it's around the 30 by 30 goal, there's also the recognition of the other values, right? The indigenous culture, biodiversity, you know, sustainable rural economies, you know, recreation, things like that. Is that the case? And, and two, it might be related, but I'm also curious if you can share some more kind of color on the role, you know, how CLF and its partners have been involved in those discussions. And, and I guess let me add one more thing to that, you know, recognizing that all the conservation partners play such an important role, but I'm wondering if you're seeing kind of a distinctive voice or the distinctive value that the friends groups and CLF is, is putting forward. Yeah, I will say, um, I think sort of the, the other values that you mentioned, Chris, I think we're a part of the sort of national conversation, but also just calling them out more specifically. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when, and as we were um, talking to the bill sponsor for the assembly joint resolution, you know, there was um, a call with a group of local organizations, just kind of highlighting what, again, where the values that we were hoping, you know, shine through and, um, you know, the process as a whole. I think we, we all sort of um, see this, right? The very beginning of the process, this is a goal, right? 30% to 2030, which is about nine years out. Um, and so it'll be, you know, a nine year process at minimum to get us there. Um, and we wanted to make sure that at this early stage, we really included some language that was intentional and clear about how communities should be engaged, which communities should be engaged, so that we didn't default maybe to um, the ways that you know these decisions have been made in the past. Um, and you know, I think we we pushed that with the um, assemblywoman when we chatted with her, but I think she was really also looking for that, um, knowing that you know this is a federal government decision. <laughs> we'll all definitely you know state legislators will play a role in that county commissioners will play a role in that, right? Or county supervisors or whoever your local electeds are will play a very important role, but ultimately the decision makers at the federal level. And so we're trying to just um, provide guidance and maybe set expectations for what local communities want to see as a part of these processes. And what we've, we wanna really make, I think um, our message clear that these places should very, be very much considered as a part of that process and that you know, community members should be heard. Great, thank you. So Chris and Tanea, a question from our chat. Would it be helpful to have sign-ons or some type of written support from municipalities, city or county? It would be great to have resources to support talking points and possibly also strategy for a friends group to make this ask of our elected leaders. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start, but please, Joss and Elian, who are on the ground, you know, making this happen, I, I think the answer is, you know, absolutely yes, right? It's the more volume, um, both in, you know, it's quantity and quality, I think, of people. It just looks, it will feel like a movement, and it also creates the conversation for you to have locally, you know, if you're local elected officials. And then it also encourages your supporters, 
follow, you know, your, your um, universe, your audience to now be kind of part of this growing movement. So yes, I, I, I think it, it is a valuable um, tool. And I think as Jocelyn pointed out, you know, there's language, you know, there's states like Nevada and California that are like <laughs> carving the, you know, path for everyone else. Um, Jocelyn or Elian? I'll also add, I mean, the cities and counties at some point will have to say something, right? Um, if if we're really building this movement to the way that it it needs to be, right, in order to meet the goal. Um, so I think trying to get um, those decision makers educated early, right, on what we hope is going to happen, the places that we see is very much a part of, of this, you know, campaign, and also, you know, what our expectations are of them. <laughs> Uh, is better to do it now than um, later, uh, because as we know, misinformation runs pretty rampantly <laughs> um, this day and age. And, and I think the more proactive we can be about what this actually means, how we see this really being implemented in our communities and what we hope to get out of it will, I think, be beneficial in the long run. Yeah. I. I, I fully agree. And I think I, I would add to that, um, even for, you know, for campaigns or places that you're not, you don't have a full, you know, nicely packaged uh, proposal yet, this is a great time to start planting those seeds with um, local decision makers. So they're hearing, um, they're going to be hearing from me, pro probably the higher ups about how, sh how should this be implemented? But if they have some ideas and know who to talk to when they're thinking about these lists or which places to protect in their jurisdictions, um, they know to turn to you and they know which areas you're already thinking about. And, and I would add, you know, that to kind of tie in that, so that strategy is, you know, helps move the dial, right? Helps move the ball to protect the lands. And it also is a tactic to help on raising the visibility, right? Because now there's another step that has just occurred that you can raise visibility on. Here's another entity, city council members. Now they can start um, promoting content on their social channels, on their website and be, you know, be part of this movement. So each of these steps and each of these individual pieces do add up into the raising, you know, the, the visibility um, that starts local, right, and then builds out. And I'll, I'll use, I'll also mention too, as it relates to the toolkit, um, so a couple, as we mentioned at the start, like this is the beginning of something we see as a dynamic document. And so, you know, Jocelyn and Eliana have already identified a couple of things that we'll be adding into it. Um, and it related here, you know, having a, um, a, a sample, you know, resolution, maybe based on Nevada, right? So having some sample resolutions. We've also talked about having a sample or an actual proxy letter, if you will, a proxy sign on letter. Um, many of you, um, well, hopefully all of you saw, you know, David Feynman's um, call out over the last couple of weeks to sign on to the National Coalition's effort to get all as many organizations, local and otherwise, signed on to support for 30 by 30. Many of you did, David might have the number, but nonetheless, for um, those who weren't able, you know, within that time frame to um, add their name to it, we do see um, value in getting at least a sign, all of our friends groups signed on to a, a proxy letter indicating support so that our hope is that we can buffer the individual requests that come out so that you have to like if someone if there's a request that we want to add our name and the friends groups to a larger effort we'll have your support signed on to this proxy letter so we don't have to come back to you every time there's a new you know mini campaign that gets um, stood up you know to support it um, one of the things I'm wondering too is if it might be helpful to create a Slack channel on our um, friends groups uh, account or channel and then just specifically for the toolkit so that we can alert you when updates are made to it. Um, and that's a place where all of you can send in, you know, requests or issues, share your own information about what's happening on the ground. So that might be something um, Tanea works with the uh, communications subgroup of that um, Slack channel. 
um, on. And then the other reference, I don't know if Jocelyn, you want to say a word or two here, but you, you know, you mentioned in terms of the inventory, right? That's in, and this really does happen at the, the federal level and with BLM. And um, there is a, you know, I'm going to uh, call it ge generically as the working with the BLM toolkit, <laughs> right? That um, exists in terms of how our friends groups historically have worked with um, BLM. And I think it's been updated last year um, for how um, groups can work with BLM. Would you want to touch on that for a minute? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, as we're all tackling um, these questions, you know, locally at our, you know, individual community level, um, we know that the Bureau of Land Management is, is thinking about this <laughs> broadly across, all, you know, all of the places that they manage. Um, it's part of you know, the executive order that was signed by President Biden. Um, and so, you know, part of that, I think nationally, BLM will start doing um, a wilderness inventory and I'll make a plug now that our next FGN call will have them on sharing a little bit more about this inventory. I think, you know, a lot of groups in the network already do this type of work, right? Which is how we identify the special places that need protection. Um, it's because we've been out there on the ground, right, and, and have surveyed and inventoried and, and kept track of, of that. Um, I think that will be a very important part of this, right? There are, I think, plenty of campaigns in the queue um, worthy of protection, right, that will continue to push um, Congress, right, and the president to take action on. Um, and again, this is, you know, a nine-year effort <laughs> and, you know, ideally, we're going to move through all of the places that we have currently identified on our list, and we're going to need a lot more places to really get us to this goal. And that's where I think all of the on the ground, right, inventory and stewardship work and um, all of the network's expertise really on on the lands and um, their status, right, will help us then get to the next iteration and help us continue moving closer to this goal. So, um, for folks who really like the campaign and advocacy work, we'll be doing a ton of that. And the folks who are like, just give me a pickup truck and, you know, a clipboard and I'll get out there. Um, we can do that too. And I think both of those parts will be very important in getting us to this final goal. And then the last thing, at least that I'll say on um, the toolkit that we'll want to explore more with the friends groups is, you know, is, will it be helpful for to have, you know, specific social media assets um, and more digital media and earned media assets to raise the visibility. I mean, this is one where it gets tricky to do a one size fits all, right? There's umbrella messaging, but it really is as all of our place-based work is, right? It's, it's so specific to your place. And so Tanae and I have been working on and we'll look forward to working maybe with the subset of the friends groups to see how best we can um, kind of find that strike that balance between providing something that is not so generic that it becomes not meaningful to your place-based work um, but something that we can actually provide to you know the friends groups that are interested so those are the things on our minds for Tanae and I in terms of um, you know social media assets how we might create a brand you know, for the friends group so that when you're doing posts and, and planning your editorial calendar for social media, for blog posts, um, that you can weave in X number, right, that they're branded within the 30 by 30 uh, content. Um, helping with earned media, some of you have been over the course of the last year or so, uh, been working with us to um, author op-ed articles you know, about, you know, taking the place-based uh, lens to 30 by 30, and we can continue that work. Um, and then the other, I think, you know, just a reality check, you know, 30 by the pro 30 by 30 doesn't happen in a vacuum. And in fact, we're already seeing, and it can, should be expected, you know, that there will be pushback, there will be cynicism. And so we also want to add to the toolkit um, you know, resources to be able to, you know, A, make sure the facts are, are uh, understood by the people who matter, um, but also be able to push back, you know, within social media, within the earned media, within your, you know, communications, um, that you have the tools to be able to um, refute, 
you know, inaccuracies and also just put forward, you know, our position, but um, that's, that's an important <laughs> component because we don't want to be flat footed um, on the cynicism about what needs to happen. So unless there's any other questions. Okay. I think um, we'll... There is a question in the, in the Q and A it says, um, we do not know if our special place is on the inventory list. How would we determine if we are? Our effort for further protection is nearly an 80 year old effort. If BLM does the inventory of these places, how would our group encourage them to place our special place on this inventory? Jocelyn, maybe? Yeah, I can take that. I, I mean, part of this, right, is the continued advocacy work that we all do, um, right, ensuring that um, you know, we're using all our communications tools to make sure that, you know, the local community is aware of it, the local decision makers are aware of it, right, all the way up <laughs> to the president um, and, right, all of the folks within the agency, right, the, the BLM, um, your state office, your local office, the, the folks at the national level, right, everyone is aware of this. I think, you know, we'll see, um, more of a national effort, right, to put together maybe some of these lists, um, similar to, again, what we saw in a monuments campaign, right, and, and so there's some sort of internal work advocating that your place gets on that list. Um, but I think, you know, 30% <laughs> sounds small, but it is a lot of acreage. <laughs> uh, and so I'm pretty sure we will need every single one of your places and ones that we haven't imagined and thought about yet. Um, so I, I can almost say, and uh, don't hold this against me, but like I, we can almost guarantee that it'll be on a list at some point uh, because we need all of these places to get there. And then I would suggest for um, the person who shared that, I would make another plug for the next FGN call <laughs> where that would be um, a further deep dive into the places and, and strategies for getting on the list. Um, let's see, I see Beverly Harry has raised your hand. I don't know if you can. Um, I don't think it allows. Put your question in. Yeah, so just if you want to okay. type it or. Apologize, Beverly, with this um, format. We were trying something new to see if we can try some interactivity. If you're not able to provide your um, question um, in the Q&A section or in the chat, if you would please, you know, um, send it um, to Andres's email. We'll we'll capture that or any of our team members here. We certainly want to um, address it. All right, uh, we'll move to the next um, section here, but we'll be watching for that, Beverly, in case you, you or anyone else wants to add in a, a question to the Q and A or to the chat. Um, so shifting gears. Uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to give a heads up um, about a call to action, a public call to action campaign um, that we're in the process of developing now to support a funding request um, to Congress for the Bureau of Land Management. And it's, specific, it's a specific funding increase for um, the management of national conservation lands. Um, I'll ask David to maybe provide some of the details about the funding and why it's needed. Um, Tanea and I um, are working on developing, you know, the, the, the theme and the key messages and the social media assets and the call to action. And what we mean by call to action is this will be a campaign that for CLF, um, our friends groups that are able, are willing and able to participate, as well as the larger conservation community, where this is a priority, the management of national conservation lands, we want, um, you know, a full-throated public support for the appropriate funding, trying to get away from the increase, at least from the public-facing um, messaging, you know, it's the appropriate level um, of funding for the, the increase of national conservation lands that, um, has, that we've experienced um, over the last 20 plus years. Um, and so we will be um, standing up a call to action page where we will drive people through social media, 
um, through email campaigns to send letters, starting with finance sub appropriation subcommittee members and then building out off of that. You know, and I'll just caveat here before I have David fill in the details. You know, we do, if we're successful out of the gate, then this will be a longer term, you know, a longer midterm, you know, level of effort, uh, meaning that we expect it to start within the next um, two weeks um, based on the committee schedule. But we're then at the mercy of the budget, you know, congressional budget process, which could take months. So we're going to do our best to keep momentum, keep it realistic. But we do need a big showing out of the gate to really help um, solidify that it's included in the first um, committee hearing. So with David, if you wouldn't mind sharing in some of the details. Sure, and clearly, Chris, you've learned a lot about the congressional budget process. So yeah. I think you can you can teach a course on it, but- For better or worse. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so thanks, Chris. And many of your organizations signed the nonprofit letter supporting this request last month. So first, I wanna thank all of you who did do that. And we've sent that up to the House and Senate Interior Appropriations Subcommittees, which as Chris mentioned, that's the first group within the broader Congress that considers these requests for funding increases within the Interior Department. And so they've received that letter from us and our organizations. Um, we're also working with other members of Congress, many of whom represent the places that you're working to protect who understand the call that we're asking for, that if you're gonna be seeking to protect more land, the agencies that manage these places need to have the resources to do it. Um, and so that was the gist of the letter that many of you signed and that we sent is that over the last 15 years, through Antiquities Act proclamations and acts of Congress, more than 11 million acres and more than 100 new units of the national conservation lands have been in a sense, given to BLM to manage under the National Conservation Lands Office and the staff within the regional and state offices. But yet funding to do that work is actually 30% less than it was in 2006. And so to Chris's messaging point, at the core, we are asking for an increase, but what we're actually doing is resetting the bar, not even where it should be, but frankly, where it was 15 years ago, and then we're going to hopefully, from that point in the upcoming fiscal year 22, beyond that, work to have it increased even more. So that's what you signed on the letter, if you signed it, and we thank you for doing that. And that's what we're engaging congressional leaders on now. And so the Interior, subcom the Interior Appropriations Subcommittees in both the House and Senate are going to be having hearings and eventually marking up their bills in the next two to four, maybe six weeks, they have to approve the request we're asking for, for it to go forward. And then the full appropriations committees would approve that. And then eventually those bills will go to the House and Senate floor respectively. And so to Chris's point, we, we need to have a show of support in the next two to six weeks to get us further down the track. And then at that point, we'll be, you know, doing this potentially for up to six months because it, it could take that long for Congress. Normally Congress should pass an appropriation by the end of September of each year. They rarely do that. So it could go well beyond that. But um, that's why this is a, it's a campaign worth investing our time and energy in, not only because it's uh, at the core, giving the agencies that we work with the resources to do the work, but it also fits perfectly into the 30 by 30 framework because we need to have more money for these agencies if we're going to have 30% of the land and water protected. Exactly right. Thank you, David. Um, so we will be in touch with the uh, friends groups, um, hopefully this time next week, um, to um, have you know, instructions and assets so that your teams can start integrating and getting those um, those pieces ready. And hopefully we'll know more about the schedule as well, but thank you in advance um, for your effort to help get the word out among um, all of your supporters. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it a, you know, maybe a, a little bit of time here for any questions. Um, 
that anyone might want to put into the Q&A or into the chat. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for your time. And if there are any questions or comments that you weren't able to get to us um, through this format, please don't hesitate to, um, you can send it to um, any of us. I think all of our addresses are mostly our first name at conservationlands.org. You can certainly send it to me, Chris, at conservationlands.org. Um, so we can collect those and um, share it with the rest of the group. We can cover them. Um, as appropriate in the follow-up email. So um, everyone here and everyone that registered that wasn't able to make it um, will get this recording um, along with the uh, presentation deck. And Chris, we did have the question come in from Beverly. Yeah, I have real concerns about environmental organizations pushing out their own needs without supporting indigenous people for land back advocacy. How do we resolve this? Further, BLM has done the most damage on indigenous lands and they know precisely how much wilderness areas are available. The feds have been doing water resource surveys ever since Jedediah Smith set foot on Nevada. So question about indigenous advocacy. Thank you for that. Um, I'll say, and I'm sure other team members um, will have you know, specific thoughts and strategies and examples. Um, I, I, will, um, I will say, that the commitment of the Conservation Lands Foundation is to um, elevate the voices of the indigenous community in co-management um, and the reflection of their values and how the lands are managed at the highest levels of government. You know, we have the good fortune of having um, strong relationships with people within the Department Interior that are working on policy um, and other elements of the administration. So that is a priority organizationally of CLF and not to be the voice, but to elevate um, and to provide space for and to reinforce um, the values and the priorities of the indigenous community. And so that is at our organization from the board down through staff and therefore through all, all of our program areas from how we communicate. So in everything you'll see in our toolkits and our um, social, you know, from social media to, you know, op-eds, um, it is a priority and is reflected in that. And then I'll ask uh, maybe Elion and Jocelyn to further provide um, our thoughts on the strategies. Yeah, and um, I'll say here it, it, in California, we don't have a you know, poignant strategy to point to regarding the, um, the collective work that, I, that we're doing with other partners, but um, through the lens um, of what Chris just mentioned, I think something that we, as you know, as nonprofit organizations, can truly advocate for are are the issues and perspectives that we are hearing from um, Native nations and Indigenous um, communities. Um, we absolutely want to support, you know, the um, the uh, Native sovereignty of of the nations, and also, you know, recognizing that there are a lot of non-federally recognized tribes here in California. Um, so a, a starting point for, for us is that, you know, we do have partners um, like the Native American Land Conservancy and the Amamudsen Land Trust who um, represent multiple tribes or who represent um, a single tribe. And so what, what we're doing is having conversations mm -hmm. with those organizations and first making sure that they are a part of all 30 by 30 conversations and planning efforts that they're able to participate in given their own you know capacity constraints and when when they're where they're not um using our voice to advocate for the issues they care about and 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 ensure that those who are leading conversations do reach out and truly meaningfully engage with with those organizations so that's that's one approach that we're taking i think um it's it's complicated, and I feel like there there could be a lot more to be done. Um, but you know, in short, it's just it looking at the relationships that we have and ensuring that the folks that we work with and the things that they care about are being represented represented. Because even though we're nonprofit organizations, we can absolutely still advocate for um, the perspectives and the issues that 
uh, Native people and tribes are hoping to pursue. I guess I'll, I'll ditto everything that has already been said and, and also add, you know, I was a part of a larger conversation um, with Secretary Holland in her first week. And I know um, returning land, right, to um, tribal nations and communities was very much a part of that conversation as well. Um, and I think broadly, again, being that this is such a big goal, <laughs> like it'll have to be a very holistic approach, right? Um, and Chris, I think mentioned this, we're not, it's not in a communications vacuum and it's definitely not in a vacuum of all other things that are happening, right, in our country. And I think, you know, returning land to indigenous communities will be part of that. I think we'll also have to figure out how clean energy, right, renewable energy plays into all of this, because um, there's obviously a big push towards um, net zero, right, emissions and, and being carbon neutral. And so there'll be a big push to move to like wind and solar energy. Um, I know we've seen in Nevada, right, um, there's now these conversations about mining for lithium, right, that'll be needed for these vehicles, right? There's a whole lot of stuff that's happening that will definitely um, all overlay with land <laughs> and how we use land. Um, and I think that that was a big reason why in the Nevada resolution, we really wanted to include like who should be at the table uh, because it is gonna go beyond just um, identifying places that we feel like could continue under right federal management in a more enhanced you know protection way. But then there's all these other <laughs> things that we will also have to figure out and balance as a part of this. Um, and folks should very much be a part of those conversations as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you for continuing to help us on the journey and make sure it continues to stay at the forefront. And because we certainly at CLF want to continue to improve our ability to support that. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure to share this information with you. And I know all of us at CLF are looking forward to continuing to work with you on um, not just 30 by 30 in our funding campaign, but everything that's, that is ahead and um, in store for us this year. Thanks very much.